Hello 3D printing friends! Today on the BV3D channel, we'll get a look at the KP3S Pro S1 3D printer. Stick around and we'll get into it right after this. I'm Brian, and you are watching BV3D. This episode of the BV3D channel is brought to you in part by these awesome channel members. Becoming a member is a great way to support the channel and has a few perks besides just getting your name and lights here. Click the join button to find out more. Hi, welcome back. Hey, if you're new here and you're wanting to learn about 3D printing, 3D modeling, and other 3D printing related stuff, start now by subscribing and clicking the bell so you don't miss anything. Okay, so today we're taking a look at the KP3S Pro S1. That's more S's than I usually see in a printer's model name, but that's okay. It turns out the second S, the one in S1, is for Sliceworks. Big thanks to Sliceworks for sending this over so I could show it to you. So you've probably seen this printer before, or one like it. It's made by King Rune, but this particular model is made to Sliceworks' specifications. And Sliceworks is providing US-based sales and support for it. In other words, if you buy it from Sliceworks, they're shipping it from a U.S. warehouse and they provide support for the ones they've sold. So for those of us living in the U.S., that's a convenience. Okay, well, let's dive into the printer's specs. Now, first off, it's a very compact machine. Ignoring the wiring for a moment, its footprint is about 22 centimeters by 32 centimeters, or just a little bit larger than a sheet of regular 8.5 by 11 inch letter size paper. Its operational footprint is larger to account for the cables coming out the left side, the power cable on the right side, the x-axis arm, and the bed's movement back and forth. And for the spool holder, which you'll place off to the left side of the printer. Its build volume is 200 millimeters by 200 millimeters by 200 millimeters, which is a bit smaller than an Ender 3 size printer, but a bit bigger than, say, an Ender 2 Pro or a Prusa Mini. The power supply is mounted inside the case, and Sliceworks includes a handle you can attach to the top of the Z-axis, so it's easy to pick up and move around if you need to. It has a color touchscreen. Although it's somewhat small, it's still usable, but if you've got big sausage fingers, you might want to use a finger nail instead of a fingertip. Nailed it! It's got a 32-bit mainboard with silent stepper motor drivers. The printer has a direct drive Titan-style extruder with a 3 to 1 gear ratio. It has a filament runout sensor, so it can let you know when to run out and get more. And the PTFE tubing guides the filament from the sensor to the extruder. This is known as a reverse Bowden arrangement. In a regular Bowden feed system, filament is pushed from the extruder through the tube and into the hot end. But here, the filament is pulled through the tube by the extruder and then pushed into the hot end. The tube is just a way to keep the filament from getting into trouble on the way to becoming a printed part. The direct drive extruder is good for printing flexible materials like TPU, and I'll show you an example of that later in the video. The parts cooling blower on the tool head is a 5015 type, meaning it's 50 millimeters in diameter and 15 millimeters thick. It seems more than adequate for the prints I've done, cooling the filament that's just been laid down before the next layer gets printed. It has a standard 0.4 millimeter brass nozzle, and the maximum nozzle temperature is 260 degrees Celsius. It uses a PTFE-lined hot end, so personally I wouldn't run it above about 235 degrees Celsius. The textured glass bed can get up to 100 degrees Celsius. It requires manual tramming or leveling, but the printer has an assisted leveling feature that takes care of homing the printer and moving the nozzle and bed to various adjustment points. It's got belt tensioners on the X and Y axes and, interestingly, linear rails on the X, Y, and Z axes. So you don't have to worry about adjusting eccentric nuts on V-slot wheels. It's pretty easy to assemble and everything is pre-wired. So all you have to do is insert the Z-axis assembly into the base and bolt it into place. And then you can connect the Bowden tube between the extruder and the filament sensor. In order to secure it at the filament sensor side, I did have to trim away a little bit of material on the outside of the tubing so it would press fit into the hole. It comes with the usual assortment of accessories, power cable, flush cutters, wrenches, both regular and Allen, a nozzle unclogging tool, a filament spool holder, a USB cable, a micro SD card, and a USB card reader, and a spare brass nozzle. The card contains a PDF copy of the manual, a couple of pre-sliced models, and a rather old version of the Ultimaker Cura Slicer for Windows only. 
So probably the thing to do if you're a Cura fan is download the current version of Cura from Ultimaker's site. It has the King Rune KP3S available, so you can add that and change the build volume to match the KP3S Pro S1. And that's easy to do. Just change it from 180 millimeters to 200 millimeters for the X, Y, and Z axes. Personally, I prefer Prusa Slicer, so I set it up in there. Prusa Slicer doesn't have a preset for any King Rune printers, so I used a different direct drive printer and adjusted the build volume to match. I think that's about it for the specs and what the printer comes with, so let's move on to what it's like using the printer. Before your first print, you'll need to level or tram the bed. This sets the distance between the bed and the nozzle so that when the Z-axis is in the home position, it's always at the same level as the bed, no matter where it is above the bed's surface. The process is pretty straightforward. There's a leveling button on the printer's home screen, and when you press it, the screen displays a set of buttons to move the nozzle to each of the bed's adjustment points. You then adjust the knob at that position so that when sliding a sheet of paper between the nozzle and the bed, you feel a bit of friction. Repeat this at all four corners and you should be done. Loading filament is pretty easy, but the reverse Bowden setup with this guide tube can add a little adventure to it. The tubing is press fit into the extruder, so what I do is pull it out of the extruder and let it hang free until close to the end of the loading process. Then preheat the nozzle to about 200 degrees Celsius and move the Z-axis to about the halfway point to give yourself some working room. Straighten the end of the filament out and cut a 45 degree angle on the end. Insert the filament into the filament sensor from below and keep pushing it up through the tube until you have a fair amount of filament poking out of the other end. Then, while pinching the loading lever, push the filament down into the extruder. When filament starts squiggling out of the nozzle, let go of the loading lever and reconnect the PTFE tubing to the extruder. When you do that, any excess filament will be pushed back through the tube toward the spool. If you're not ready to print yet, set the nozzle back to zero degrees. But if you are ready, select the file you want from the card and the printer will start printing. And speaking of printing, here are some things that I printed. All the things that you see printed in green, that's in Sliceworks' Robitoby Green PLA. The first thing is this standard XYZ calibration cube. This was one of the pre-sliced models on the micro SD card that came with the printer. This came out pretty good and I'm happy with the result. I also printed a CHEP cube that I sliced in Prusa Slicer and it looks pretty much the same. One thing I did notice though is this vertical stripe pattern on the Y faces of the cubes. You can see it on the face with the Y and on the opposite face as well. It's not really prominent on the X faces, so I don't know what's causing that. How much it shows up also seems to depend on the lighting too, so I don't know if that's really a huge deal, but I did want to mention it. Next, I printed McGuybeer's Caladragon model because it's small and cute and it generally takes less than an hour to print. It gives a good idea of how a printer performs on a more organic type of model and it shows how the printer handles overhangs, and the antler things act as a stringing or retraction test. There are a couple of little strings between those antlers and between the tip of the tail and the body, but it's nothing out of the ordinary. The backs of the antlers look good, which indicates sufficient airflow from the parts cooling blower. The overall surface looks smooth, and I think this is a great print. I also printed Ari of the Dragon, designed by Luby 3 d Ari is details printed well. The legs and the tail came out really good, but there's that little bit of stringing between the top tips of the wings. And I have a 3D Benchy that also came out good. No issues with the overhangs on the bow, and the window and doorway arches look fine. But the stern and the back of the wheelhouse both show that same repeating vertical pattern as on the Y faces of the cubes, because those were on the Y axis as well. But overall, it's not a bad print. And here's the Maker's Muse Clearance Castle. It's a single print-in-place model that tests a printer's ability to accurately print parts that have tight clearances. It also tests bridging ability, and it includes a built-in puzzle to unlock the castle gate. So the drawbridge's hinge works great, and I can easily raise and lower the drawbridge without any binding. And looking closely at the drawbridge, you can see that these long bridged areas printed really well. These are completely unsupported, and the printer did a great job of bridging those gaps. Well, next, I have to solve the puzzle to remove the core of the left side tower in order to unlock the castle gate. 
Now bear with me. I haven't really memorized the left, right, up, down, A, A, B, B thing, but eventually I can get it. Okay, there we go. So now that the tower core is out, I can lift out the castle gate. So the printer passed the clearance castle test with flying colors. One other thing I printed was this spool holder because I'm not a big fan of the one that comes with the printer. This design is from over seven years ago and it works really well for me. I've printed this one before and I like it. It's got print in place octagonal nuts on one side and threaded parts on the other and you can choose from various widths of the bottom and top arms to accommodate the spools you use. I printed the 80 millimeter wide ones in black poly terra PLA, but the two sides are still in the Sliceworks Roby Toby green. Next, this is a replacement foot for the leg of a folding table, and I did a video about that recently. This is printed in Overture's black TPU filament, and I don't have any issues with this print at all. The print looks good, and it's squishy, and the direct drive extruder handled it without any trouble. Now this is a print I really like. It's a VW microbus, but there are a bunch of hexagonal holes cut out of the roof, so you can use it as a pin or a marker holder. I found this over on printables.com and thought it would look really good in that green. There are several pieces to this model, so you can print them in different colors of filament if you want to get fancy. I printed the wheels in a silk silver for a metallic look, and the tires are printed in TPU. Once all the parts were printed, I stuck them together with 3D Gloop, and I'm super happy with it. When you put it together, you can go for the normal ground clearance look, or you can go for the dropped look. So I dropped it. It'll hold over 40 pins, and it looks good doing it. By the way, there are links in the description for all the things that I printed, except for the replacement foot for my folding table. Although, if you want me to upload that, I will. Comment and let me know. About the only thing I had trouble with on the printer was the power loss recovery feature, but for some reason, I seem to have trouble with that feature on a lot of printers. I tested twice, and both times the printer refused to extrude filament when I selected resume. It would move the nozzle around like it was printing, and the extruder would retract when it was supposed to retract, pulling the filament back from the nozzle. But when the retraction was done and it was time to start extruding again, it would only move the filament forward as far as it had retracted it. It just moved the filament back and forth like that, never making any real forward progress. So you can see what that looks like on this CHEP cube. The only filament being deposited on the model after resuming the print is what oozed out of the nozzle. It's a weird issue, and I've run into it before on other printers. I mentioned it to Sliceworks, and they said it'll be fixed in the coming firmware update. I also tested the filament runout sensor, and it did successfully let me know that it was time to run out and get more filament. It beeped very loudly several times and paused the print. Then I loaded more filament and resumed the print, and it finished. There's a little line here where it resumed, and I suspect that's because the sensor was triggered while the outer surface was being printed. And that's where the print actually resumed. If the sensor had triggered while the nozzle was working on the inside of the model, I don't think there would have been any way to tell that a filament runout event had even occurred. Okay, so now that we've seen some prints from the KP3S Pro S1, let me get into what I like and don't like about the printer. I'll start with the things I don't like. I don't care for the spool holder that it comes with. It's nice and compact, but it's not attached to the printer. And since the spool rims have to ride on those bearings, cardboard spools that are bent or damaged won't work well. It would be cool if there was an option to mount a spindle and arm type of spool holder on the back left corner of the printer. I like the convenience of a handle on the printer, and I want the spool holder to come along for the ride when toting the printer from one spot to another. As it is, I ended up printing a different spool holder to sit beside the printer, which I showed earlier. And there was that issue with the power loss recovery feature where the printer wouldn't actually extrude filament when resuming the print. There was also that issue with the vertical stripe pattern that shows up on the y-axis side of some prints. And like I said earlier though, that one kind of depends on the lighting and on the model. I think that's about it for the things I didn't like. And now, here are the things that I do like. First off, I like the use of linear rails on the x, y, and z axes. That means you don't have to mess with adjusting the eccentric nuts on V-slot wheels to get them just tight enough, but not too tight. The printer is also pretty quiet. The loudest thing on it, apart from the beeps it emits when it wants your attention, is the fan on the power supply. And that isn't ridiculously loud, so it doesn't bug me too much. 
I like the direct drive extruder with the gear reduction on it, particularly for printing flexible filament like TPU. The part's cooling is good, and I like having the handle on top to pick the printer up. I'm also pretty impressed with the build volume relative to the size of the printer. And Sliceworks has been very open to feedback. There's some hardware improvements planned, for example, adding a way to securely mount the PTFE tube over by the filament sensor. They're also working on updating the firmware to fix issues like the one I ran into with the power loss recovery feature. And there's the USA-based sales and support for the printer. The printer may be made in China, but Sliceworks is based out of California, and they're pretty active in the 3D printing community as well. Apart from the sheet metal, nearly everything on the printer is a standard off-the-shelf component. So down the road, if you're past the warranty period and you need to replace or upgrade something, you shouldn't have to worry about sourcing proprietary parts. Also, it's small enough that I wouldn't mind having it on my desk. And that's my likes list. It sells for $249 US, and considering the features, it's a pretty good little printer for the price. Sliceworks thinks it would be a good choice for print farms, and they have a volume discount on the printer and on filament. It looks like the price break kicks in when getting more than six of them. I don't know how much the discount is, but you can drop them an email at sales at sliceworks.com and ask. Thanks again to Sliceworks for sending this printer over so I could show it to you. Well, 3D printing friends, that's about all the time we have for this episode. And now that we're at the end, let's go print something cool. Hey, real quick before you go, I wanted to say thanks for being one of the super awesome people who sticks around all the way to the end, and thanks for all the likes, comments, and shares. And an especially big thanks to those who directly support what I do. You're all wonderful for doing that, and I really appreciate it. If you liked this video, a thumbs up would be great, and if you'd like to help support the channel, check the description for ways you can do exactly that. And hey, if you haven't already subscribed, please do. It's absolutely free, and it's an excellent way to help keep me making these videos for you. Well, that's it for this one. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time here on the BB3D channel.